Hello. Are you all ready to start? Is everyone? Yeah, there's the enthusiasm we've been waiting for. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's good to have everyone here. This is a fantastic, fantastic turnout, which is what we love to see. Um, as usual, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give out the ground rules before we begin. Um, just after the presentation and things, just give Thirsty Giraffe a few minutes to actually clear the chairs out and get their tables out the, before you start bombarding them with with questions about food and ordering food and things. And then once that's done, then go for it. Have drinks, have meals, enjoy your night. It's meant to be a full night thing, so make the most of it. So moving on now, I'm going to, John and myself are going to be talking about some of the realities and challenges of conservation. This is by no means, it is our personal experience, but it's also experience from talking to all the conservationists in the field. We've been in the field for, for many years now, and obviously we know a lot of people, we deal with a lot of people, we engage with a lot of people, and it's just, we think it's time to actually just communicate these things and talk about them, because it's a good thing to do. It's the whole point of these talks in the first place. So I'm going to start out with, with actually an a open question to the floor here. What does conservation entail? And I'm going to ask, before I ask this, all the conservationists in the crowd don't answer this. Um, but for everyone else, what, what do you think conservation entails? What do con when you look at a conservationist, what do you think they do on their daily basis? We need some hands. We need some volunteers. Let's, let's do it. Throw, throw words out. What do you think we do? Catching animals. Prote protecting animals. Okay. Catch, catching, protecting. Sure. Yeah. Anything else? Manage the environment. Manage the environment. Okay. Educating people. Good stuff. Okay. And it's true. We do all these things. We do amazing things. Don't get me wrong. We do absolutely incredible ex uh, things. We get to experience things that very, very few amounts of people actually get to experience. You know, we get to work directly with animals. We get to work and we get to go out into incredible unexplored areas and actually do these things that people from the outside look in and go, wow, amazing, incredible. But in reality, that's only such a small part of what conservationists as a whole do. And, and I've put this here that conservation is not a typical job with office hours, and it's really not. So we do these amazing things, but it's such a small part and there's a, such a common saying that says, that, you know, conservationists get paid in sunsets. And it's because we don't work these typical hours. You know, we're out at crazy times of night and, and early, early mornings at two o'clock in the morning and things. So it's really, it's this other side, this other side of conservation that we want to explore tonight. And, and really the realities and challenges that conservation as whole faces. So... The first thing we look at, and this is just the first topic, is the emergency responses that conservationists deal with. So, obviously, this video looks incredible. Thank you, Joel, for sending this through. This is a, not all emergency responses look like this, but I absolutely wish they did. But it, it often just means driving for four hours, you know, to go and just investigate something. So... A big part of what we do is these emergency situations and actually dealing with things that happen, you know, at the spur of a moment, you know, when you've just gotten to the end of a long day and something happens, you get a phone call and all of a sudden you need to race somewhere to go and actually respond to, to what's happening because there's animals and, and things that need to be dealt with. So I'm going to hand over to John now and he's going to talk a little bit more about the dark side of things. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and thanks so much for the amazing turnout. Uh, just to say that straight off the bat, they're wonderful to see this place so full. So, uh, yes, myself and Carl, I mean, we just kind of felt it's a good opportunity to talk about some of these things and just put it out there. A lot of the public don't really see what happens behind the scenes. So we're in a very fortunate, unfortunate position to be dealing with people that are doing this day to day. And I mean, there's several veterinarians sitting in this room and I mean, Carl's lived with a few of them. Carl and Carrie, they know how many call-outs uh, were happening just as you're about to open a beer on a Saturday night. 
Um, it's part and parcel of work, and it's the sort of stuff that goes unnoticed. I know every now and then there's a newspaper article about, you know, this leopard has been saved, that's been done over there, but this is uh, just a bit of interesting data from Ben and Joel from Wildscapes, actually, looking at the number of animals that they've actually dealt with in the last few years, and it puts it in perspective. This is not stuff that is planned for, budgeted for. This is coming on top of your typical day job. So you're kind of sitting there, you're getting all of these quill outs, and if you're looking at snares alone, and that's why for many people and several people in this room are going to elaborate a little bit later, it's becoming this incredibly intense situation um, across Africa, not just in our area. Um, but if you have a look there, it's over 130 snares that they've kind of intervened and assisted with treating animals, trying to keep them alive. It's not always possible, but at least somebody is going and reacting. Animals escaping out of areas will elaborate a little bit further. And as you go down poisonings, it's something I'll chat a little, a little bit about as we carry on. Pollution, collisions, orphans, poaching, conflict. All of these things are additional to a regular position or a regular job. It's not the sort of stuff we ever expected to kind of get involved in when we started. So this is just a little bit more for, I think, the international audience. As many of you know, we have Painted Dog TV, who film and like, put these videos out there for the international audience audience as well so to put some perspective a lot of people don't know what snares are so essentially it's usually cable wire anything that you can kind of use to actually have animals in the bush walking into these traps they get stuck and it is a gruesome horrible death you know it's often from exposure thirst uh, dehydration those are typically the scenarios or even extreme blood loss as you've seen i mean have a look at that leopard over there if you can see, I know the TV is a little bit small for many of you, but if you can see the cut marks on some of these animals, it is extreme. And only a handful of them are actually saved that are still alive by the time you get around there. So since COVID, we've seen a massive, massive increase in snaring. And it's not something that's sort of over there in a game reserve that we never have to deal with. I mean, even in Hutzbray Town, Palabora, some of you are from Palabora, lots of issues with snaring around there. So this is not something unusual. Um, so I'm in the lucky position in some ways with my work. I've gotten to meet a couple of fun people and spend a lot of time, especially this little crowd on the left here, running around in the bush there collecting snares and trying to help out where we can. So just to put in perspective, the Palabora Natural Heritage Foundation just this year have removed 1,451, am I right, Eugene, snares just from their area. So I think that in itself deserves a bit of a round of applause. And I know that seems like, oh, it's quite a fun thing to go do on a weekend. Well, come and do it when it's 42 degrees outside and you're working until 3, 4 in the afternoon. It's, it's, it loses the charm very quickly. But the value is that we still have organizations in our area that are actually getting around to this. So this is just a quick example of one of the days that I happen to join them. So in one day of field work, we pulled out 178 snares. And you can see just from that little area there, and I mean, by the end of the day, I think we were all absolutely finished. Ronya actually joined us. Some of you might know her from the Guernsey area there. Um, but yeah, these sort of days get fairly intense. And it's not something I ever, ever in my life thought that I was going to be dealing with. But it's become quite a regular part of our jobs. So some of the photos you will see tonight are a little bit graphic. Uh, we did want to kind of show some of the stuff, which we don't see on a regular basis and we normally don't really publicize. Uh, but just a few examples. So when we're talking about what snares are, you can actually see Ronya standing there. It's hard to see the cable, but some of these snares would be the size that you can virtually walk through. Them. So these are aimed at species like elephant, buffalo, giraffe, very, very large game species. It's not what a lot of people assume. They're just, you know, trying to catch a diker in a thicket somewhere. Um, it is an intense situation. This in the middle was one of the little poaching camps. So we actually, people had poaching dogs in there as well. And that's a, a freshly caught water carcass that they were busy um, skinning and probably about to cook there just while they were staying in the reserve. And then lastly on the right, so this is sadly an elephant calf that had broken a snare off and walked who knows for how long before it died. And that carcass was actually poisoned and we had several vultures dead on that carcass afterwards. So it's something that beyond the physical aspect of actually doing a lot of this work, just the mental side is quite hard to cope with in many ways. So it's sort of you become used to it after a while, which is concerning and just very graphic, but for example, that elephant was sort of a completely severed head. And this is a very, very regular scene on areas all around Woodspread, all around Palabora, that it's sort of hidden in many ways from the public's eyes, uh, or we feel it is in many ways. But there's like these groups of amazing people that are out there and putting their efforts and putting everything into reducing this as much as we can. 
All right, so we're going to move on to one of the other things, and this is, uh, again, like probably my main role these days in terms of working with the Endangered Wildlife Trust is dealing with wildlife poisoning scenarios. It's, again, when I thought myself and my fiancé, Lindy, who is right there, when we sort of started, we thought, this is going to be great. You know, we're going to be working with birds of prey and you know, like in the low fault, you know, you couldn't wish for a better job. And it sort of moved into the situation that our main focus is now emergency response and dealing with these catastrophic declines in many species in, in uh, well, in Africa. So just to give a bit of background, I don't know how many of you know much about wildlife poisoning. I mean, anybody in this room that's never really heard that that's a problem at all? You want to raise your hands or is everybody quite familiar with the fact that this is happening? So I think it's a clean slate. Everybody's heard of this at least a few times before. So this is a little bit of a study that was done actually looking at declines and specifically in vultures in Africa. So to put it in perspective, so 61% of poisonings are due to human wildlife conflict predominantly. So poison birds where they're trying to get rid of the animals for hiding other sort of crime, criminal activities. You know, if you poached an elephant, for example, then by poisoning the carcass, you hide the fact that the birds are going down. So Anti-poaching teams don't find this. This is a pretty common scenario. Then 9% energy infrastructure and road collisions. So just to put it out there as well, it is something else that is of concern to us uh, when working with birds. Then 29% persecution for belief-based use. So in our area, we don't see it as often. But if you go to different parts of South Africa and across Africa, a lot of vulture body parts are still being used quite regu regularly. And there's a lot of demand for vulture heads. Uh, in certain areas. People do believe that because vultures can find carcasses so efficiently that they can actually see into the future. They dream about where carcasses are. And the next morning they wake up and they go, cool, I've got to fly 100 kilometers over there and we'll find something. So people believe that by using vulture body parts, you can predict lottery numbers, for example. You know, it's, it's sort of a pervasive thing throughout the continent and pretty widely believed. So that definitely has an impact. But the reality is you can actually combine the last one as well, 1%, with sort of recorded killings where people might try and eat vultures occasionally uh, or just shoot them for some other reason. But you can probably combine these three and close to 90% of deaths of birds of prey, scavenging birds of prey, are from uh, poisoning scenarios these days. So everybody knows their vultures super well, I'm sure. Everybody lives in Hoodsprates. So I know you're all familiar with them. But the typical white bag vulture, we see them almost every single day in Hoodsprate. Now this species, as I'm sure everyone's aware with the IUCN classifications, is how we know what the conservation status is of for species globally. So you can see in 2004, the white back vulture is still listed as least concern. That means we don't have any sort of obvious reason to be worried about it. We assume everything's good and well. And in the space of 11 years, it's gone from absolutely no issues to on the edge of extinction. So that rate of decline is absolutely absurd. There are very few other species out there that have actually achieved this. We have uh, Martin Taylor somewhere in the crowd, he normally hides at the back, but if anybody wants to chat to somebody about IUCN classifications, Martin's your person. Um, but this is the sort of thing that is happening around us, and Hitzbrecht is an absolute bubble. Uh, when we go further north, when we go south, we see huge variation in these populations, and the reason it is a bubble is because we are so, so lucky to still have people around us that are putting the effort in and keeping this a safe space. So just to give it a little bit of an overview, so part of the work we do, and I mean Joel joined us a little while ago uh, on a random phone call and a random mission to go get a couple of birds uh, further north from us. So to put in perspective of what actually happens, so if we kind of get pulled out to a wildlife poisoning scenario, kind of just want to say what the time frames are and the realities of this. So and how many people are involved. So, I mean, you get initial phone calls saying, listen, there's a bit of an issue. Can you guys respond? And we always kind of try and get out in about 15 minutes wherever possible, and we hit the road. Uh, and in this case, the road was about a seven-hour drive, which was wonderful. Um, you know, really, really lovely little road trip there. So you got to decide who's coming with you. How often you have no clue, like how many animals are there? What do you need equipment-wise? There's very little information to really go on. Uh, in this case, this was actually not too bad of an area to search. It was fairly doable, but still, I think we had to park two and a half kilometers roughly from the nearest road. So any birds that we got were sort of shuttled under somebody's arm and cradled up and down and up and down throughout the day. Then from there, you do emergency treatment. Um, whatever you can do, it, we do at least have very good success rates in terms of keeping birds alive. Um, but even that's it's quite draining, you know. You're literally on your feet the entire time, just working nonstop. 
Then from there, you got the transport side. So now we've got to get birds to the nearest rehab center, which in this case is about six hours. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a trudge. You've got to stop every hour and a half, roughly two hours at most, to check every single bird, make sure whatever treatment needs to be done, get them to the rehab center. And once they reach the rehab center, that's when the real work starts. So every bird is checked for 48 hours after arrival. So in our instance, we take the bananas to Moololo, and they have an incredible team who literally do not sleep for two days solid. Uh, and they, they work themselves into the bone. So normally after two days, we rock up with a bunch of pizzas and just say thank you so much for the amount of time we've all put into this, because uh, that's the only thing that seems to be working. And then if we're lucky, and I must be honest, in the last year or two, we've improved things massively to get close to 100% survival uh, for poison birds, which I think is pretty phenomenal. Um, but we get to the point that after a couple of weeks, we can release them. But the point is, you know, a newspaper article will say, cool, there was a vulture poisoning, so many birds were involved, this is what happened. But the reality is that there were two weeks of hard graft by a lot of people, and a lot of people doing this after hours, random times, at the drop of a hat to actually get involved with this. So this is a nice little illustration of some of the people at Moolo so Becky and Marshall, and Jazz and Nikki, they have done worked on many, many birds by now. Uh, and a lot of the stuff seems fairly simplistic. It doesn't seem particularly complicated, but it's so valuable in just in terms of keeping these animals alive. And to put it in, in perspective, I mean, white-headed vultures out there. Does anybody want to guess how many pairs we have breeding in the low felt? Sort of greater cougar and surrounding any, um, areas. We see white-headed here now and then, but anybody want to guess? Yeah, zero takers. Oh, we got one. Oh, you are super close. Yeah, yeah. The last, it's about 60, 65 pairs of white headed vultures. So, you know, everybody's talking about wild dogs as an example of how low those numbers are. These are way lower uh, in comparison. So, if we lose one or two white headed vultures, that's a significant hit. And as I say, I mean, white back vultures are declining at easily 7% annually, uh, globally. That's not just for our area. So, that's, that's pretty scary stuff. Um, so this is just an example from uh, Gerald Almeida from Mozambique. So one of the scenarios that happens is veterinarians get called out to things and they don't really know what to expect, as I'm sure many here will actually attest to. Uh, so Gerald said this is the first time he just got called out and said somebody's like, there's birds flopping around in the felt, we have no clue what's going on. And he also had very little knowledge in terms of how to deal with it. So it is a bit of a graphic video, but just kind of puts a little bit of perspective over what happens. Um, so as you go around there, these birds do look dead. Pretty much all the birds in this video are still alive. That's a hooded vulture. It was about 100 to 200 pairs in South Africa at most. And you kind of see these scenarios and you kind of get there and you go, right, all you can do is say, let's pick a corner and start. Um, because it's actually too overwhelming to kind of put up a game plan and say, all right, that's the structure. That's how we're going to do it. It's not really possible. Uh, in this instance, I think there were over 100 birds that were still alive. They maybe saved about 30 in the end, 30 to 35, and it was very basic treatment just because everybody said there was no proper, proper plan in place because you can't really have a good plan in the scenario. Most of the team have never dealt with this. Almost nobody's ever worked on this before. This is actually a poison elephant uh, that was used as a bait source, which is why there were so many birds involved. So yeah, in this scenario, you can imagine if this is a few kilometers from a road, you like six or eight people there that are kind of trying to save the world there one bit at a time. It gets, it gets pretty challenging. And often what we do find at these scenes is around the sort of the main carcass is a little bit more manageable in many ways. You know, the birds are weaker, so you can catch them, you can grab them and work with them more easily. But as you get further and further afield, you get these like little clumps of birds that are scattered around, that can sort of half fly, half not fly, they get very difficult to catch. And you basically just keep going till sunset, and then the next morning, wake up again, keep going till sunset, because at night you're not going to find many birds, and just kind of repeat until you run out of anything that you can get. I mean, that's sort of, when I see that, that's my worst case scenario, uh, just trying to catch any of those birds. It was pretty much good luck. Um, Sorry, some of these videos are a little bit graphic, um, but this was actually just outside of Hitzbrecht. So just to put in perspective, not very far, 10, 12 kilometers from town. And this was Lindy's second or third day working for the EWT, which, as we were saying earlier, you kind of think, cool, you know, working vultures, this is going to be great. And there was a poisoning scene just outside town. And Lindy, how many birds were affected there? So 65 vultures were killed at that scene. And one of the farmers about a kilometer away 
sent a video of this jackal sort of convulsing alongside his fence and suspected that that was actually from this poisoning seat. So yeah, it is pretty graphic, but this stuff's happening on our doorstep and you very, very seldom actually hear about any of this. And lastly, something that it's sort of starting to get into the news a little bit at the moment, but the increase in lion poaching is really starting to, to kick off in a lot of Africa at the moment. So it is quite distressing and it comes with an associated declines in a lot of these species of birds of prey in particular. Um, but you can see, actually, if you look at these sort of carcasses, the number of dead insects you see around there, definite, like an easy sign to see that this was a poisoning event. Um, but yeah, it is a, it's a scary fact. And I mean, we've often said to a lot of the reserves saying like, it is something to put on the radar because it's on its way and it will kind of get to us sooner or later. All right, so escaped wildlife. This is a bit of a, another one I don't really deal with too often. Uh, Eugene's giggling there because I'm not the world's biggest fan of lions, but every time I see him, we end up having to dart a lion somewhere for some reason. Uh, but yeah, this was a fun one where a couple of lions actually got out of a protected area northwest of uh, uh, Palabora, and that was, we started, what, 7.30 in the morning, and I think finally moved the lions, dropped them at like 9.30 at night. I think it was like the final day. So it was a bit of a challenge. We couldn't find the animals for half the day. It was all over the show. I think Jerry, the pilot, who everybody saw flying over, was very over it after a few hours of taking off and landing. Um, but the point is, this stuff's also happening around us. Uh, it's great, maybe not as much as other areas, but at the same time, you know, every time this happens, one person sees a lion on the R40, a message goes out, and there's still somebody that actually needs to get in a car after hours and go and deal with this and make a plan. And often it keeps going and going. I mean, we just finished one of our surveys in Balili and like the one day got cancelled because the guys were out um, the entire evening and they just said, sorry, we're not in a position to work uh, the next day because we haven't actually gone to bed yet. And I think Lindy spoke to one 12 o'clock the next day and he's like, oh, no, no, we're not quite done yet. So that's uh, heading for 38 hours on his feet. Um, but that's kind of the realities. Uh, well, there's Eugene and Fernando there somewhere in the room as well for, for uh, some of the other lines that got out. And I'm sure this is one of the few ones that actually made the newspapers. I don't know how many of you guys know of Kurt, uh, from Balili. But uh, yeah, when his car actually got completely totaled by an elephant and R40. So that actually got out there a little bit. But to put in perspective, even the safety concerns, you know, elephants are often the animals that are out on these roads. And you're just kind of sheltering the public in many ways, like being willing to take the brunt uh, of the concerns with this. All right, so surgeries and rehabilitation. So I'm going to go through this fairly briefly because it is a very, very big field and there really should be 16 veterinarians standing and chatting about this. Um, but it's, it's quite fortunate. We're really, really lucky in terms of the capacity we have. Um, to put it in perspective, Mozambique, when it comes to wildlife veterinarians, has, if I remember correctly, six for the entire country. Uh, so one of the guys we chatted to earlier in the year, he's going to Nyasa, so there's going to be one veterinarian and five and a half million hectares uh, running around and kind of going, I have to do whatever pops up, you know. So to put it in perspective, I'm sure we have 14, 16 vets around with spread. And even there, everybody is stretched to their absolute limit. Um, but at the same time, we are lucky in terms of having rehabilitation centers. So after a surgery takes place, we still have somewhere that these animals can go because it doesn't end with a surgery. I mean, some of these are very, very long term rehab cases. Um, so just a couple of the examples, I mean, some of the stuff we deal with is in particular the vultures there when they have wing breaks. I mean, this is quite an extensive thing, but you know, obviously you need an emergency surgery. Hopefully the wing is broken in such a way that it can be fixed. And then the rehab process after that can be as much as six months, often around three months or so. We kind of hope for a fully healed wing. But in that meantime, you know, there's somebody checking these animals every single day, making sure they're fed correctly, making sure the medication is being handled correctly. Um, you know, juvenile birds falling out of nests. Yes, the kingfisher might not be high up on everybody's list of priorities, but isn't it wonderful that we actually have people that are willing to get, like assist any sort of species out there, not just limited to you know the big and the cuddlies and the stuff that we all kind of see as high profile. We're also very fortunate. He was here this evening, um, but in terms of reptiles, there's not many places in South Africa where surgeries on reptiles are fairly common. And we're super fortunate with the Hitzbred Reptile Center, as well as the guys up in Fernando and Lani, and they're here somewhere. Oh, I can see Fernando there, Philippe. Um, they are standing in the back there, but there are very few people that are actually competent and capable of doing these things. So, I mean, that python, for example, this happens every now and then, actually got hit with a chainsaw. 
And that's an extremely long-term process. You know, if these animals, especially in winter on a dead tree stump, somebody's, you know, not no ill intent often meant, but chainsaw is flowing through and all of a sudden you see, oh, something's changing and they have a massive python, python in there. So somebody still gets that like crazy phone call saying, listen, there's a partially alive python. Can you guys assist? And somebody jumps in a car, rushes out there to try and help. Um, it's a pretty wonderful situation we're in for all of these tragic cases. And then lastly, mammals. I mean, we often, anybody that knows me well knows I'm not the world's biggest fan of big mammals. Uh, I'm very much a bird person. But it's great having these opportunities that animals like hedgehogs. I mean, how many people here have seen a hedgehog in the wild? I don't think there will be many hands lifted in this room, actually. So they, they're quite rare. But in Balabora, I mean, Fernando, you guys have had two or three now, I think. So these situations happen and still wonderful people that can actually assist with these. And just to put in perspective, I mean, obviously not every animal is going to live. Like, there is a point where if they're not going to make it, they're not going to make it. You can't force an animal to stay alive if the injuries are too severe. Um, but if you can look after them and they can survive, like, this is a perfect case. That fish eagle looks shockingly bad. Uh, no pun intended, but that was an electrocuted bird. So if you look at the wing on the left-hand side there, you can see all the flight feathers were completely roasted. So... Um, Dr. Jess Briner did a lot of work on this bird, along with Mohula Ulo, for example, and it's still at Mohula Ulo, still got a couple of months to go, but when that bird came in, I said basically zero chance of survival. Um, the skin off its feet uh, had actually come off the feet, and over the first few weeks, every day, their job was basically just to get all the rotting skin off and allow that to recover over time. So it was months before this bird was even functionally standing, and now it's at the point that it's, you know, perfectly capable, it just needs to melt out its feathers. Because obviously anything with a wing like that is not going to be flapping particularly well. But the point is, we have some way that this can actually be done. And I do want to give a little bit of a shout out to the guys from Animal, Re uh, <laughs> Animal Relief for Rural Communities. I don't know if many of you know them, but up in Palabora, they're actually one of the first centers globally that's accredited for assisting with rabies control. Which, yeah, we're proof, absolutely. That is actually pretty something to be really proud of. Um, but again, it's something that not only assists people, but it also assists wildlife. I mean, species like jackal interaction, interacting in community areas in particular, it is a huge risk. And if you see the big picture, with reductions in species like vultures, jackal probably will increase. And that puts rabies on the radar as a prevalent concern. All right, that's enough of me speaking, so Carl's going to take over for the next little bit again. Now's when you start cheering again. <laughs> Thanks, John. See, so, it's, so I'm going to move on to the next part of it now, and a part of largely what conservationists do, and it's, it's community engagement. It's, it's dealing with everyone that lives in nature, which is everyone. This includes, you know, farmers. It, it includes people in, in rural communities. It includes children. It includes tourists. It includes scientists. And it's often underestimated as to how much effort goes into this engagement with people. And in reality, not everyone you, you engage with is an easy person. Not everyone you engage with is willing to cooperate kind of thing. But as conservationists, you have to almost be a chameleon and adapt to everyone that you interact with. Because at the end of the day, if if your interaction with someone goes poorly, what can happen is that you could lose an expansive land that you could work on. If someone doesn't like you, they can say, okay, well, you can't work on my property. Simple as that. And then what goes on from there? Well, John's just shown you a whole bunch of things that have, that, that have gone on. So actually working with people is a massive job. And actually keeping people updated with, with what's going on takes, takes a lot of time and effort that people, that conservationists and people in the industry are actually putting in just to keep people updated, keep them interested, keep them aware of what's actually going on. The next thing is, if this works, is the financial aspect of conservation. And I've mentioned this before, for those of you who have been to these talks before, financial side of things is a massive, massive, massive part of conservation. Massive. For the conservationists themselves, they often have to raise funds for not only the work that they're doing, so helping the species that they're wanting to conserve, 
but they're having to raise the money for themselves, their own salaries a lot of the time. And I know a lot of people don't work directly in the field of conservation, but a lot of conservation is based around the application of grants. So grants are funding that comes from overseas uh, that you apply for. And in a lot of these grants, it's like, yes, absolutely, we will pay for you to do this with animals, that with animals, we'll pay for this equipment, that equipment, but a lot of the time they say, but we don't want to pay for your salaries. That's it. So a lot of time and effort goes into raising funds for salaries, uh, raising funds for your own salaries in order to actually do the work. And it's one of the massive difficulties. Then there's admin. I mean, I'm, I'm not even going to ask who likes doing admin here, yeah, because that's a, that's a no-brainer. But for conservationists, it's, a, it's also a massive, massive part of it. For every property you visit, for every little bit of field work, for every poisoning, for every uh, snaring you do, it involves admin, it re involves reports. Not to mention the amount of permits that you need to apply for. If you want to move an animal, you need a permit. If you want to research an animal, you need a permit. If you want to take blood from an animal, you need a permit. And all these things take a lot of paperwork. And then there's the data that you collect. So everything that conservationists and even researchers do, you're collecting data constantly. So you're collecting data, but you actually have to do something with that data, whether it be making maps, whether it be actually writing you know, peer-reviewed journal articles, which take massive, a massive amount of effort to go into this. And in reality, a lot of this admin work gets squeezed in, in between all these other things that are actually making a difference. And what it results in is a lot of time this gets done in ridiculous hours of the night. So this kind of leads me into, into the real challenges that on, often on an individual level that conservationists face, is that the mental toll. So John already showed you some of the really grim pictures and videos of the things that a lot of people deal with. And a recent study found that actually a third of conservationists actually deal with moderate to severe psychological distress. And this is just because you're dealing with these really grim situations, whether it's eco-anxiety, whether it's really just dealing with animals dying in front of you, and you might become accustomed to it over time, but that is not necessarily a, a good thing, because you can kind of, once you leave the industry, it, it, it all comes back to kind of haunt you. Um, it's also the case of when you're in the, on the front lines of conservation, you're dealing with massive safety concerns. I mean, for a lot of rangers out there, they're really legitimately putting their lives on the line. I mean, we had a presentation a few months ago from Matt Lindeberg, who just, I mean, he gave a whole presentation on, on you know, the dangers of, of that rangers face. For poisoning incidents, you're dealing with poisoned animals that are, will definitely affect us if we get poisoned. And a lot of the time, you know, for conservationists, it affects our work-life balance because it gets very tilted towards work and your own life becomes, you know, secondary kind of thing. So there was a recent study that found for rangers in Africa, on average, they work 72 hours a week and see their families about 10 times a month. Very, very, very little. And a lot of the time, you know, because... All these emergency things, all this funding, all this admin work, things are getting overtime. So people are working more than they should be, um, and it's, it, it really plays a toll. And I mean, there's people, yeah, some people who even, uh, I know that they've, they've made commitments even to help species, even on their wedding day kind of thing. So it's people really going out of their way, and at the end of the day, it becomes a financially challenging thing because... You know, you're doing this, you're doing all the overtime, but in reality, I don't know if I know a single conservationist who gets overtime pay. It's just something that doesn't, it doesn't actually happen. And actually going into the, into the conservation industry is its own challenge on its own. People will spend, you know, tens of thousand rands to get a degree in environmental science or conservation or something like that only to leave the degree and what, where, do you, where do you land? You need to go in, into paid volunteer positions. And then it's just more debt. And then you finally make a break and you get an underwhelming pay. And unfortunately, people very quickly realize that although this is the dream, it's, it's often not a long-term career. And it results in 
in people seeing conservation or realizing that conservation is actually a short-term career. So not only is conservation undercapacitated, there's not enough people to deal with all these issues, but the people that are coming through are not sticking around. And this is a massive, massive issue from conservation as a whole in general. Enter, and this is our big announcement for the night, for those of you who read the poster. No, it's not working. It's fantastic. Nature on tap. Okay. This is our announcement for the night. Um, for those of you who have been here before, we've, we've always been doing these talks. It's always been a great turnout. Um, but we want to start raising funds, not for the things that are happening, but for the people that are actually doing this work. For the people that are going over time, for the people that are going out of their way, for the people that are doing things on their wedding days, we want to actually support them and give them the means to actually feel like they're actually doing something and feel like they're making a, 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 a big influence in, in conservation. I know we've got lots of people here. Hood spread, like John mentioned, is a little bubble. It's a big bubble, actually. There's so many people in this, in this area that do absolutely incredible work. Absolute. I mean, lots of you will know all these people on here. And I'm going to use someone, I'm going to use Grant, who's on the top left corner here. I don't even know if he's here. But I'm going to use Grant. And I'm going to say, you know, Grant knows everything about wild dogs. The ins, the outs. He knows everyone. He knows everything. You take him out. If he, if he decides or if he realizes actually this is unsustainable for me, what you're doing there, what happens is that you lose decades of experience with, with losing someone. You're losing that capacity and it's actually very, very, very detrimental to, to conservation as a whole. And this is, you know, you take the combined experience from everyone here and there's so many more people that we didn't even fit on here. If you lose them, you're losing centuries of collective experience that should be uh, helping species. And actually, we need to be capacitating conservation rather than just losing people constantly. So when I go back to this nature on tap thing, before I continue, we need to go back to, you know, where did this start? Where did this idea of ours actually come from? So these talks actually started way back in 2019 when uh, it was actually just a group of us we thought oh you know let's just let's just do some talks to the the researchers and the scientists and conservationists in the area we'll do a talk once a month and see you know we'll maybe get 20 people and we can discuss a few sciencey nerdy stats and things like that and then whatever well actually what happened was that we it was all talk, and then John just put an ad on Facebook saying that I'm going to be doing a presentation, <laughs> amazingly. So I realized then that I was doing one, but it was a massive turnout. I mean, for that first one, it was, we actually did it outside here, and it was, it, there, were, there was not enough place to stand, much like tonight, which I'm very, very chuffed about. So we thought, okay, well, let's expand this. Let's, let's try and get the whole of Hootspread included, you know? And we said, okay, let's change it to the Hootspread Conservation and Research Club took it from there and it's just been constantly we've been like constantly been in the situation where people are just happy to come happy to listen happy to be involved and now it's at the point where we're like okay this is doing really well let's take it that step further let's rebrand let's relaunch let's call it nature on tap and let's see if we can actually make an impact actually tackle these things that conservation is is struggling with so from the beginning, we've, we've kind of identified that there's a few things that we, you know, the pillars of what our goals are. The first one is to provide free and accessible education to everyone. So we could, you know, we could have from the start started charging all of you to come to this talk, but it's, it's against what we go for. We want people to have access to all these amazing things that are going on. We also want to create this community of, you know, people aware of what's going on in their area. And then finally, the new one is actually just to generate funding and actually assist the people that are trying to, to achieve all these goals and to help all these species and to actually just help the environment as a whole. So over the years, obviously, we've, we've 
been trying to provide this free, this free environmental education. And this is all the talks we've done so far. I mean, there's, there's quite a few, but you look at them and you look at the people that have come and spoken at these talks and it's, you know, it's not just ran, random people that come and talk. These are experts in their fields coming to talk, coming to engage with people, coming to share the information that they've learned and try and educate people. And this is what we want to continue. We want to we want to make sure that, you know, everyone has access to this information and not just people who read about it, who actively search it. The second thing is we want to create this, you know, this community about, about conservation, based around conservation. So show sure, and who has been to one of these talks before? Fantastic. Who's been to more than five before? Fantastic. Who has met someone new? At, this, at these talks before. Fantastic. Who has learned something new at these talks before? This is what I'm talking about. This is it. This is the point of this. We want to build this community and I, I really encourage you to engage with the people that are here. Chat to them. See if you have anything in common. And I know from a viewer standpoint it's nice to learn things but actually from a speaker standpoint it's massively, massively useful because Community engagement, as I mentioned earlier, is, is a big part of it. And actually to do a talk like this, it's an easy way to engage with a, a wide variety of people all at once and get people interested, let them know what you're doing. So this is really, really an important part of it that we want to try and embrace and get people talking and get people on board and see if we can all collectively start making a, a, a difference. Then the third, the third part is is obviously what we want to try and do and this is the newest thing we want to try and actually provide some financial assistance for for the people in conservation as a whole um so the things that we we're aiming to to fund is kind of emergency responses mitigation responses as well as the rehabilitation and surgeries that's that are happening but not just you know particularly the people that are going out of their way that are pushing over time that are not sleeping, that are actually doing all these crazy shifts and things. These are the people, we want to support the people. So if someone wants to do, for example, if someone's like, no, I've had enough of these, these snares, I'm going to arrange a snare sweep, um, and you go and do it. Our goal is to say, okay, no, happily, let us know, and we can at least compensate you for that work that you are doing. We're not going to set it up ourselves. We're not going to say, yeah, we're doing a snare sweep. But we want to actually provide funding for people that they can actually go and do these things on their on their own, their own initiative. A good example is is in KZN. There was a random outburst of, of rare toads that pitched up, and uh, the community the, the community themselves actually decided, no, let's do something. They're all on the roads. They're getting flattened. Let's make an effort. Let's go out and move these toads off the road. Those are the kinds of things that we want to help. We want to help these people that are actually really really going out of their way. To, to make a difference. And the way we're doing this, so uh, obviously I mentioned we want to make sure that these talks remain free and that's not going to change. So moving forward, we want to we want to encourage donations. You know, it could be two rand, it could be five rand, it could be 50,000 rand. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, anything like that. But also we're partnering, we're partnering with with Thirsty Giraffe. So Thirsty Giraffe has agreed that, you know, moving forward from now for all the drinks, there'll be a, on the nights, you know, they might charge 10% on top of all the drinks for, for the talk night. So we actually start building a, a kind of income from the thing. And, and for some of you who don't know, the reason we do these talks on Tuesdays and, and Thursdays moving forward is because it's Thirsty Giraffe's quietest night. So it's actually a win-win situation. So we're helping our local, you know, the pubs and things that we actually love, but we're also helping ourselves and we actually, it's just a kind of cycle. We also have Painted Dog TV who are online who are trying to, you know, they love this content. We love them for filming this content and it's just trying to build this up. But you might be asking, oh, you know, is this, is this going to be enough funds to actually do these, is to do these things and to actually start these, these things up? And this is where we're thinking big. We are not thinking thirsty giraffe. We are not thinking thirsty giraffe, I promise you. We are thinking much bigger. 
much bigger. The goal is we want to start creating the park run, for lack of a better term, the park run of conservation. Start working with local pubs, seeing if they're willing to fill up their pubs on the emptiest night of the week, create some kind of collaboration, whether it be the, you know, the 10% uh, tax deductible donations. We are now officially linked to an NGO, so people can donate and get tax deductions. So we need to create this mindset and actually create this countrywide, worldwide maybe one day, <laughs> idea of you know, creating this, this fund that can, people can tap into and really start making a difference. Um, part of it as well, the reason we keep it in pubs is because, you know, it's lovely. It's lovely for me to stand here and be able to talk to you and have a sip of my beer every now and then, you know. <laughs> it's fantastic. We want to keep it informal. We want to make sure that people are approachable, that there's no, you're not just going into a hall talking and then vanishing instantly. We want to make sure that people can engage with the community, engage with the people that are talking, engage with the conservationists. So we really want to make sure that this becomes a kind of new thing. And we've actually, where's Fur and Lani? They've agreed, and Eugene, they've already agreed to start in Palabor. And this is, this is the kind of thing that we want, to, we want to start promoting. We want to create the central fund that we can start addressing these big issues in conservation, get people involved, engage the community. So I urge any of you here, I know a lot of you are local, but if any of you know of anyone around the country or anything like that that might be interested in this, please let us know. We would love people to buy into this concept and actually see if we can, we can do something about this. And uh, John put this in here, uh, a classic quote, and it's the little things that citizens do. You know, that's what makes the difference. Um, this person... Wangari Matai is uh, planting trees. Or maybe for the Hutzbrate community, it's, you know, attending nature on tap and expanding nature on tap. So this is the thing. We want to just keep this going. In terms of the people that have actually started this, this was, as I mentioned, this started many, many years ago. Um, but now we've got, a, we've got a core team. It's myself, my wife, Carrie, Lindy, John... Sarah Goodman, Kayla, and then Julie and Garth, unfortunately, have left the Hoodspread area. They've moved to Australia. So they were the originals, but we're in the process of trying to convince them to start it up in Australia. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. But this is the kind of, the kind of idea that we're trying to buy into. And, uh, and then I can't continue without thanking the collaborators that we've, that we've worked with. Um, Paint a Dog TV, they've been great. You guys have absolutely been brilliant with actually filming us and being on board and just helping us out wherever we need, make, giving us lighting, giving us mics, giving us all these amazing things. Um, Thirsty Giraffe, I, if anyone needs explanation, then we'll chat afterwards, but I don't think it does. Um, and then Scale, so this is our latest, our latest team up here. Scales is providing us with some administrative and financial support. So if, if anyone's willing to donate, it's going to go through Scales, but they've provided us with a, um, a savings account, and they are NGOs and non-profits, so it all goes through them. It's going to be Section 18A tax deductible, but we're really, really grateful for, for them for actually offering these to us, and they're not taking any fees for, um, by doing this. So big, big thanks to them. So... Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely a round of applause there. Thanks to all these collaborators. And then also just on that note tonight, we used, it. this is def definitely not information that John and I have had access to on our own. All the vets around Hoodsprayt, Jess Briner, Wildscapes, uh, Fern Lani, they've all provided a lot of information for this talk. So really also a big round of applause to them and for the work they do. Yes. So we're going to, um, this is not the end of the presentation, but I'm wondering, are there any questions yet? Are there any questions? Surely. Scream at me. <laughs> Tundi. When do we get the bank account details of how to put money into scales? It's coming next. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming soon. Yes. It'll be on, it's in this presentation still. <laughs>
any questions about poisoning, about snaring, about time management, about funding, anything. John, what poison has been used? <laughs> the one question I don't know. Um, so the poisons are, they're fairly diverse, but they're pretty much all carbamates, organophosphates. Um, sorry, who asked the question? I'm, I'm not sure I'm talking. There we go. Um, so yeah, agricultural pesticides. So almost everything's legal as well, which is a bit interesting. Um, it's the sort of stuff that's sprayed on everything we buy in pick and pay and spar, uh, which is a bit terrifying, obviously grossly misused. Um, but yeah, it's one of the biggest challenges is how widely and easily accessible these toxins are. And that's not just in our area. I mean, you look at like Burkina Faso about a year ago, they poisoned 3,000 hooded vultures in a couple of months. Uh, and all of that fairly easily. Um, but yeah. Oh. <laughs> all right. Uh, any other questions around the room? Ah, there we go. So uh, the question was like that, that little video with the elephant poison and the, the birds around it. So that instance, it was actually poached for tusks, and that's what we call sentinel poisoning. So it's an instance where people are trying to get rid of vultures, which are used as a, a sentinel by anti-poaching teams. Um, and it's fairly, uh, I want to say very common practice, not so much in South Africa just yet, um, but we are sitting with a very big elephant population, and the rest of Africa is not sitting with a big elephant population. So there is obviously this drastic risk that that is going to start entering sort of our country sooner or later on a bigger scale. It has happened, but we're not quite at the point of these continuous uh, events. So interestingly, with like rhino poaching, we basically, it does not associate with poisoning very much at all. It's very quick to get a rhino tusk off. Elephant tusks, a oh, rhino on, sorry. <laughs> Elephant tusks obviously are a much more um, time-consuming thing. All right, any other questions around the room? I guess. So, yeah, quite an interesting question, actually, about snaring, uh, asking if it's often close to, like, boundaries, if it is as far into big protected areas, uh, both. Obviously, it's a lot more easy to do closer to the buffet areas, just with walking distances. Um, but at the same time, I mean, uh, snaring events could be pretty much anywhere. Um, I used to kind of have very much the opinion of, no, it's got to be, like, right on the edges, but that's, that's changing fast, I would say, at this stage. Uh, especially since COVID, there's been like this very, very sudden change. Obviously, you know, financially, a lot of people are worse off. So switching to like the meat trade, essentially, is what a lot of it's based on, is becoming a business in many ways. So yeah, that's pushing people further and further and further into these areas. And also in some protected areas, the buffers are already being quite hard, badly impacted. So you've got to go a little bit further. It's the same principle as sort of overfishing in an area. You know, you've got to move that next step further along. Um, so, yeah, does that answer that? No, I'd wonder, Terrell. So, what, in your opinion, um, is the best way to share the That's an amazing question. Um, so for whoever didn't hear that, Irol was saying, fair enough, we have this important sort of information and it's stuff that is often not put out in the public too much. But how are we going to get to a point that we can make this public? And I think there are a couple of good examples, you know, and just that continuous communication. Um, and it's a difficult one. Whenever it's something to do with poaching, there's a lot of sensitivities around it as well. Um, a lot of properties obviously don't really want to discuss it too widely. It is a concern. And we have to always be respectful of that in many ways as well. Um, but if we look at what, for example, happened with uh, pangolins and what, you know, Warren's at the back there, in terms of a species that's gone from most people 30 years ago probably didn't know what that was to now being at the point that it's basically Disney movies, you know, it's like a, a globally known species. It can change. And that's why we were saying we do want to move away from, like, let's not just be a bit sprite. Let's kind of make it big, make it all around the country. And it might be a case of people that have spoken here. There's been a great talk. And somebody says, can that person in future plan to be down in the Western Cape? Because there are people that are fascinated to hear more about this. I think 
kind of moving away from that stigma of certain things should be a little bit hidden and like not discussed. Acknowledge that it's sensitive, but try and push ourselves to actually just be honest about what's really happening out there. Yeah, it's definitely a, it's a good question because it's also from an advertising perspective from conservation organizations, you know, as soon as you start saying and you start sharing these, these grim situations, you know, people switch off. They're like, well, if someone's lying in bed at the, at the end of the night, you know, scrolling through Facebook, they don't want to see a leopard that's got a snare around them. They want to see these amazing things that are being done. So it's a really, it's, it's kind of balancing that too. I think you got to kind of, you got to kind of keep people interested with the exciting things that are happening, but you also got to make them realize actually, well, that's a reality. Because as soon as you start throwing in too many realities, it becomes people switch off. More questions. Come on, team. Yes. Um, so yeah, the question was like understanding the link between snaring and poisoning. So, for example, like whatever else you've mentioned that's very important, how are they to link with each other to in the end just to create the difference? So basically, if I'm kind of putting it in, or understanding the question correctly, it's like what are the sort of things that we kind of feel are relevant, and how do they actually fit together? So that's the summary that I'm putting out there. So. If we're looking at a lot of the reserves, a lot of the positions are, you know, you'll have typically ecologists, you have your anti-poaching teams, but from our perspective is looking further than that on a lot of the properties that are very undercapacitated. And there's a lot that actually needs to be done in terms of keeping functional diversity and keeping these areas going the way they should be. And it can only be done if you also include outside of there. So if you look at some of these world-class reserves like Timbibati and Placeri, they're incredibly well managed. Yes, there are obviously issues, as with everywhere, but things are fairly under control. But, you know, it takes a huge amount of pressure all for properties if you can kind of expand that as a bigger safety net going across there, so like snaring and poisoning, for example. I never thought that we'd really see a major link, but there's a massive link. Almost every, every poisoning incident we deal with is linked with snaring. Uh, otherwise, there's probably not going to be much chance of me and Eugene seeing each other as much. You know, Palabora is very far away. Um, but yeah, at the same time, you know, we've now acknowledged that actually all these links exist. And the more you work on it, the more you understand where we do need to start overlapping. Uh, as I say, I mean, on reptiles, Dr. Jess Biner from the reptile park, like, you know, probably would never have really bumped into her unless it was for being in this field and then realizing we've got one of the top avian veterinarians in the country. Um, on our doorstep, you know, getting those people to come together on a bigger way is, from our perspective, the only way to kind of expand conservation rather than just kind of keep it contained into what it is right now. All right, anybody else? Last chance? Cool, so we're coming to the end. This next one is tons. This is going to make you happy. How to actually contribute to this idea that we have. Um, like I mentioned, we've, we've teamed up with Scales, Cash. We've actually got a very cool little classic piggy bank that was bought for us today. Um, card, there's the bank details, EFT. Um, there's the QR code. It will take you to a PayPal account and you, could, you guys can all donate. Um, and really, we don't, we don't, in reality, we don't know how big this is going to go. We really don't. We have, we're starting small, we're thinking massive. So this is trying to plan for the future, trying to get things going, see if we can actually make a difference. So please, if you guys have five rand to spare, if you have 10,000 rand to spare, <laughs> you, you never know, you never know. It, it'll all go towards a good cause. It really, really, really will. We can promise you that. And all, all, the speak, all the people in our team, this is absolutely all voluntary. None of us are taking any cut from this whatsoever. It's just to help 
you know, the other people that are trying to actually make a difference but feel like they are struggling themselves. More exciting stuff. Our next talk is only two weeks away. Two weeks. We got two talks next month. This next one is going to be by the Bataliers. They're going to talk about how they fly for conservation and kind of get out there and seeing how they can make a difference. And I'm going to come back to this slide now, but now it's time for free giveaways. Who's excited? Yeah, there we go. There we go. So this is also, you know, we, we want to support local. We want to support the people that we, that, you know, the people in the area, the people that are trying to make a difference. And thankfully, you know, all these people, Brad Hawley Safaris has thankfully donated us a water bottle. Um, Washesha socks. If you guys don't have Washesha socks in Hoodsprite, get with it. <laughs> get with it. They are, it's really amazing socks. Um, Charlotte has, has donated some socks for us. Wild Wonderful World, they already do very similar work. They've also got an emergency fund if anyone's interested. They've donated an amazing leather journal. Um, I might steal it if, you, if no one else wants it. Um, down to the wire, I mean, they deal with a lot of snaring stuff. And uh, yeah, they've donated, I think it's four bangles to us tonight. All free giveaways. Wildscapes, thanks to the vets, they've donated... Uh, what did you donate? <laughs> <laughs> a cap, a cap. <laughs> They've donated a cap. Thanks, guys. <laughs> and then we've made some shirts for Nature on Tap because you know we want to spread the word. We want to we want people to see who we are and uh, get get the name out there a little bit. Get people involved. In terms of winners, it's time to check under your chairs because there should be a little sticky note. Wait. People who are standing, you are too slow. There's no need to throw drinks around, people. Just be aware. So, well done to everyone. We look. We don't have. We don't have all. We don't have a million shirts to give the sizes you want. But I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can find a source for them. But yeah, please, Carrie. Carrie will help you find what's what's what you need to get and she's going to distribute evenly as as possible and oh well, carrie and sarah they're there looking nervous why don't you guys wave since you're part of the team hi hi there we go where's lindy lindy also wave is kayla here yet no oh well garth and julia are waving from australia so yes please guys you got your free gift um, really thanks to all, all these amazing local, really local people that have got their own amazing things going. Thanks to them for, for, their, for their, you know, donations to us. And uh, we'd be happy to accept your donations on behalf of the newly announced Nature on Tap. Thanks. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for, for listening to John and I waffle on for, for a little bit. And I'm going to put this back here. If anyone's interested in bank details and QR codes and, and all that stuff, please. Um, thanks, everyone. And just a reminder to just give Percy Giraffe a, a moment. Oh, and one last announcement before I forget. I almost forgot. For those of you who are keen, and I'm, I'm going to force it on some of you, to be honest. <laughs> um, the film Painted.TV is going to stick around for a little bit longer. Please, go up to them. Stand in front of the camera and just share a little bit about why you enjoy these talks, what you've gained from them. Um, don't say things that you don't like about the talks, please. Um, <laughs> if it's me, come tell me personally. But, but please, actually go up, have a chat, look into the camera, have a cry, get emotional. <laughs> you know, please, let's get it out there. We're going to make a little video from it and see if we can actually, actually take it further. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. I hope you have a fantastic evening. I've, I've been coming to these talks since they were started in Hoodsbrad. And the only time we miss them is when we're out of town, which isn't much. And it's been an absolute treat to, to have access to all this information and all, meet all these uh, amazing people with their 
great tales of the good work that they're doing. So long may it continue. We're going to see you at the next one. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Dr. Jenna Wallace, and I attended tonight's talk. It was wonderful, um, very eye-opening. I am involved with a lot of marine mammal um, conservation and rescue. But what I will say is I have been very close to a lot of to quite a few people here in South Africa and what I did not realize was the intensity of snaring. I knew that snaring was happening um, because of Down to the Wire being so close to the founders of that um, company but I did not realize that it was a huge proportion of what's happening out here. Um, and the world needs to see the ugly photos. I mean, they're hard to see, but that's the reality of what's going on out here. Um, the other part that was just astounding, um, so for instance, in marine mammals, we have very few vaquita left in the world. I was just shocked by the numbers of the white pepper vultures that have declined um, just exponentially um, just in the last couple of years. So this was an amazing talk and I will absolutely do everything I can to try to help increase the awareness. Um, but yeah, amazing talk and I encourage anybody who cares about animals and the planet and the world of conservation to attend. All right, so what a fantastic evening tonight. I'm so, so chuffed to have uh, friends and colleagues starting off such a phenomenal initiative called Nature Untapped. I think the most important thing for me, I absolutely love these talks. I love the community behind it. Conservation is an absolute team effort. And something like this just brings everybody together for one single purpose, and that's conservation of biodiversity of our natural world. And I'm just so chuffed it's actually friends of mine that at the end of the day, we enjoy a cold beer together, talking about fantastic work that everyone's doing. So the whole presentation was really informative, a lot of things that I didn't know. Um, yeah, a lot of different projects that are involved, um, that are kind of connected and do a lot of work together. I really like that about our community, that everyone can kind of get stuck in and do things and get, get the work done. I really like the concept of Nature on Tap. I think that more communities and uh, people should get involved and get together for conservation. No, what a great uh, initiative. The uh, Nature on Tap is the perfect opportunity for people to understand what's going on in a simple layman's terms. And I think uh, the work that is happening it needs to be spoken about and the opportunity to spread it far and wide is awesome. So well done to the team and I think it's a great opportunity. Absolutely, I'll be at uh, the next one with the Bataliers. Perfect, but so uh, yeah, just to add to some of the aspects that um, uh, Carl spoke about today and you know one of the big issues I have uh, so firstly I'm Ben I'm one of the veterinarians that deal with a lot of the cases we work with is uh, the legislative aspect and I mean you saw a lot of the viewers would have seen the stats uh, the number of snares and the number of snared animals we deal with but the stats we don't see is the the number of prosecutions that result from all these snares and I think that's one one aspect uh, in conservation that that we really need to work with uh, we need to work with lawyers with lawmakers to, to try to change our legislation to make it a bit more um, I don't know what's the right word but a bit more harsh on people who you know transgress the law and and, and put these snares out um, so that's a, a, it's definitely a big aspect that I think um, we need to focus on and it's, you know, the sexy part is going out and, and catching these animals and, and helping them and, you know, everyone wants to get involved with that but no one wants to sit behind the books and, you know, change legislation but that really need, needs to happen and I'll give a very good example. So in Mozambique, there's a specific case that happened about two years ago in Maputo Special Reserve where a father and a son was caught snaring they were caught with one uh, one red dike which is protected game in Mozambique and they were sentenced to 11 and 12 years respectively the father and son and I mean it sounds very harsh but you know that's that's a type of measures I think that need to come into place to, to for us to start making a difference and also 
uh, if people are caught, they need to be prosecuted properly in the country. You know, otherwise, it's just we're just putting a bandage on a on a big wound here. So that's just my five cents, and um, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the talk. See you soon.